Luke 12, 54 through 56. Then he also said to the multitudes, Whenever you see a cloud rising out of the west, immediately you say, A shower is coming, and so it is. And when you see the south wind blow, you say, There will be hot weather, and there is. Hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it you do not discern this time? Jesus was rebuking the multitudes for not recognizing the times they were living in. Jesus, the promised Messiah, was standing right there before them, and they didn't even know it. If the multitudes of Jesus' day missed Jesus' first coming, how much more important is it for us today to discern the times we live in and make sure we don't miss the signs of his second coming? Are you discerning the times? Welcome to the Watchman channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is $Watchman1963. Thank you all so much for your prayers and support. God bless. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. Luke 21, 26 through 28. Men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. The specter of nuclear war is now looming, with threats from both Russia and North Korea. Some experts fear that President Putin will call for the use of nuclear weapons before accepting defeat in Ukraine. As for North Korea, the United States is deploying an aircraft carrier into the Asia, Asian Pacific, launched rocket over Japan, and Dale Hurd has the frightening details of that. This video of a rail line north of Moscow reportedly shows a train operated by Russian nuclear forces headed toward Ukraine. At the same time, NATO reports Russia's Belgorod nuclear submarine has left its base in the Arctic Circle. The Belgorod, the largest submarine in the world, is capable of carrying Poseidon nuclear torpedo drones, which Russia claims can send 1,600-foot nuclear tsunamis into coastal cities when detonated. This has set off alarm bells in the Western media. But would Vladimir Putin actually use a nuclear weapon against Ukraine or NATO? when he knows that any launch could be met with massive retaliation. Putin put NATO nations on notice a few weeks ago, saying we will certainly use all the means at our disposal. This is not a bluff. Former intelligence official Rebecca Koffler, born in the Soviet Union and the author of Putin's playbook, says Putin would absolutely use a nuclear weapon under certain conditions. This type of conflict is exactly the type of situation for which uh, Putin, on his orders, the so-called nuclear warfare uh, doctrine was developed that was called escalate to de-escalate. Koffler believes Putin would choose a small tactical or battlefield nuclear weapon that would only affect a relatively small area. You're escalating by popping a nuke in a conventional conflict, in this case of Ukraine, in order to de-escalate the conflict. With the Russian army retreating in Ukraine, Putin could decide that a nuclear weapon is the only way to turn the tide of the war or force Ukraine to the negotiating table. He's also facing pressure from Russian hawks on nightly TV shows who have been calling for the use of nuclear weapons. But former CIA director and retired Army General David Petraeus warns that it would be met with an overwhelming response from NATO. Uh, so it would make this disastrous situation even more dire 
uh, for Russia. On the other side of the world, there was a major escalation by another nuclear power, North Korea. A launch Tuesday that sent a rocket over Japan and set off warning sirens showed how Pyongyang could threaten its neighbors. They probably got 50, 60, 70 warheads. Doesn't mean they can be delivered on a long range missile. So even if North Korea tried to send one to the United States, they might fail. And even if they succeeded, we might intercept it with our Alaska, California missile defense system. North Korea launched two more short-range ballistic missiles into its eastern waters today and sent warplanes to the South Korean border. The Pentagon has dispatched the carrier USS Ronald Reagan to the area. New missile launches overnight by North Korea, the latest in a series of provocations, inflaming tensions with the U.S. and its allies. And our chief global affairs correspondent, Martha Raddatz, is in Washington with the latest. And Martha, also some news about North Korean warplanes flying close to the South Korean border this morning. Absolutely, TJ. Just a short time ago, a dozen North Korean warplanes flew in formation on the South Korean side of a surveillance line. In response, 30 South Korean warplanes have been mobilized. But thus far, this show of force has not had the effect the South Koreans and the U.S. were hoping for. Overnight, for the second time this week, North Korea launching ballistic missiles. Two short-range missiles fired into the sea east of the Korean Peninsula. It was Monday when the North Koreans rattled Japanese citizens by sending a medium-range missile right over Japan for the first time in five years, that missile traveling farther than any like it before. In response, the U.S. and South Koreans have conducted live fire drills as a show of force. But a South Korean missile launch on Wednesday turned into a military embarrassment. Shortly after liftoff, plowing into a nearby military base and erupting in flames. No injuries were reported, but a local lawmaker accused the South Koreans of threatening the lives of local citizens and failing to give them warning of the missile launch. In fact, the South Koreans didn't report the mishap for hours and only after videos were posted on social media. So this morning, tensions are now so high that the USS Ronald Reagan aircraft carrier is heading back to the waters off of South Korea, bracing for what comes next. TJ? What is that, Martha? What is the concern about what comes next? Well, I, I think the biggest fear is that they conduct a nuclear test, something they have not done in five years, so that's a real escalation. It's been a prolonged drought in Somalia. Some of its regions haven't seen rain in two years. Desperate for food, water and grazing for their cattle, thousands of people are fleeing their homes, walking long distances under the scorching sun. Mohammed Ahmed Dirye and his family left their coastal city. The 60-year-old says he had to walk more than a thousand kilometers to get to this desolate camp, hoping to get food and shelter. If you walk some distance out of here, you will see lots of bones. Lots of animal bones pile up on the top of each other. From all the corners, the sight of these bones will shock you. Not only here, but throughout the region. Somalia is one of the poorest countries in the world, battered by decades of violence, war and political instability. This drought could be its worst yet. The UN fears the crisis could be similar to the 2011 famine, which killed more than a quarter of a million people, half of them children. Thousands have died so far. Malnutrition is killing children every day. The situation is critical. Aid workers sometimes take the limited resources from the hungry to treat those who are starving. Somalis blame the Russian invasion of Ukraine for depleting international aid they used to receive every year and for soaring food prices. The war between Ukraine and Russia has worsened the situation of oil and wheat, which are not available. We bring the food all the way from Mogadishu, and the prices have skyrocketed since our land is dry and unproductive. The most desperate live in central and southern parts of Somalia under the control of a shabab. The UN blames the armed group for contributing to the 2011 famine by deliberately blocking or burning aid deliveries and targeting aid workers. For the time being and until aid arrives, hundreds of thousands will have to deal on their own with cholera, 
malnutrition and starvation. When Amna Mahmoud's one-year-old daughter Hawa started to lose weight four months ago, she thought it was just a phase. But Hawa's health continued to deteriorate, and now Amna has brought her to a malnutrition center for treatment. Because of the cost of food in the market, most of the time we can only afford to give her milk. Things are very expensive, and even when I nurse her, there's not enough to keep her full. Hundreds of children in Kasala, here in eastern Sudan, suffer from malnutrition. It's the result of a poor harvest the previous season that caused food prices to rise and left many families struggling to provide for their children. Recent floods have also destroyed hundreds of thousands of hectares of crops, raising concerns about food security, especially in rural areas. Half a million of the children suffering malnutrition are categorized as severe cases and in urgent need of aid, according to the children's agency, UNICEF. Amna hopes her daughter regains her health soon, but fears that as long as she struggles with the ability to afford food, her condition will get worse. We are currently living in a time Jesus refers to as the birth pains. We are fast approaching a time known as the tribulation that Jesus says will be the worst time in human history, as we read in Matthew 24:21. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. We are currently witnessing events that will continue to become more frequent and more intense until God pours out his final judgments on an unbelieving and unrepentant world. One of the judgments described in the book of Revelation includes the price of food being so high and scarce that it will cost a full day's wages just to barely get enough to eat as we read in Revelation 6, 5 and 6. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. In this prophecy, it will cost a day's wages just for a loaf of bread. We are not in the tribulation period yet, but we are getting extremely close. A race against time in this hospital in Sehwan, a village in southern Pakistan. A growing number of children suffering from malaria and other contagious diseases are being rushed to hospitals. The country is trying to overcome the aftermath of its worst floods in recent memory. Most of these patients are from areas that were submerged when unprecedented monsoon rains fell in August and September. Doctor said she had malaria. This is our fortnight here and I'm worried. There is nothing to eat here. The floods displaced more than 30 million people. Wadiri Khatun lost her house, along with her husband and two children. Getting food and shelter is a daily struggle. I am a pregnant woman and it's hard for me to get some food for myself and my kids. I go barefooted to get some food where I have to wait for hours and hours, which is putting my life and that of my baby at risk. There isn't any help from anyone. We're dying of starvation and diseases. One third of the country has been affected by the flooding. The authorities are desperate for international aid. The devastation has made people more concerned about threats from climate change. And in a nation that suffers from long cycles of drought and high temperatures, many fear the worst may be yet to come. Abandoning their homes and heading for dry land. The floodwaters rose quickly, forcing thousands of people to leave nearly everything behind. Unusually heavy rains caused rivers to burst their banks. Making things worse, two dams further upstream in neighboring Burkina Faso were also overwhelmed. Normally, the rains come in June, July, and by this time it is subsiding, but because of uh, the issues of climate change, uh, the weather patterns somehow has changed. Ghana's own dams are under pressure too. And if water isn't released periodically, it could lead to an even greater disaster. Some of these people are heading to camps. Others are staying with family. For now, they have little choice but to wait until the water subsides. Jesus declares this in Matthew 24, 37 through 39. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. 
Jesus tells us in verse 37, when our days parallel the days of Noah, he is returning. One of the things that parallel our days with the days of Noah is the unprecedented flooding the world has been experiencing over the last few years. Jesus goes on to tell us in verses 38 and 39 that when he returns, things will be going on as normal as people will be eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage. Just as in the days of Noah, when people were caught off guard and the flood came, so also will people of our time be caught off guard when Jesus returns. Look at this massive sinkhole. It's one of many that can be found in Konya, Turkey. The region is dealing with a sinkhole epidemic. There are currently over 2,000 of them. This is due to several geological factors, an increase in people using groundwater for irrigation, and a drought. Although they're fascinating to look at, their presence has locals fearful. Professor Fatula Adik, head of the Sinkhole Research Center, says a mixture of an increase in water demand, plants that consume lots of water, and a lack of rain is causing this phenomenon to get worse. Some of the sinkholes are so massive that they have revealed man-made caves and traces of life from thousands of years ago. But they're still considered a climate disaster. Romans 8, 21 and 22. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Jesus, speaking to his disciples about the signs of his coming and the end of the age, declares this in Matthew 24, 12. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. The Bible tells us lawlessness is the violation of God's commandments, as we read in 1 John 3, 4. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Sin will be so rampant and so commonplace in the last days that the love people once had for one another, for many, will be non-existent. In this prophecy, Jesus Christ is describing an ongoing breakdown in the relationship with God. And since people's love for God is waning, it will be evident in the way people treat one another as well. A symptom may be that the love toward other people is decreasing, but the real cause is that the relationship with God is cooling off. This is what we are witnessing in our world today. We have an unfortunate update on the family members in California who were kidnapped at gunpoint earlier this week. Authorities have found their bodies. The sheriff says they are now able to talk to the suspect. Mola Lenghi has the latest. Not the update anyone wanted. The Merced County Sheriff here described it as his worst fears coming true after those four family members who were kidnapped from their place of business here behind me. Their bodies found dead. The bodies of eight-month-old Aruhi Derry, her parents, her uncle, found on a nearby farm last night just hours after investigators released chilling surveillance video showing the family being abducted at gunpoint in broad daylight from their trucking business here on Monday. Still no word on a possible motive. Now, police did say one of the victim's ATM cards was used at a bank. Now, the suspect, 48-year-old Jesus Manuel Salgado, taken into custody Tuesday after attempting to take his own life. His own family turned him in after he allegedly confessed to them his involvement in the kidnapping. Now, the sheriff, overnight, understandably emotional about the killings. There's, just, there's no words right now to, to describe the anger I feel and the senselessness of this incident. I said it earlier, there's a special place in hell for this guy. Now, Salgado does have a criminal record. In 2005, he was convicted for armed robbery and false imprisonment. Robin, he was paroled back in 2015. A horrific story out of Thailand overnight, a mass shooting at a daycare center, and the gunman, a former police officer. Yeah, just really a difficult story to report today. Savannah, we now know, according to Thai police, that 36 people have been killed in this mass shooting, including the gunman. They say that 22 were children, most of them killed in inside that daycare center along with two teachers and a police officer. This happened in the middle of the day local time, lunchtime, 12.30 in the afternoon in a town about 300 miles north of the capital, Bangkok. Police say the gunman, a 34-year-old former police officer, went into that preschool, that nursery, and opened fire on children and teachers and also uh, stabbed some of them. Uh, one witness told Reuters that he forced his way into a locked room where children were sleeping, the youngest victim believed to be just two years old. Police say the gunman then fled in his own car. They say he was shooting from his car as he fled, also running into people with his car, and finally arrived home.
home where he killed his wife and his child before turning the gun on himself. Now, Thai police are not commenting on a motive this morning, but they do confirm that he was fired from the police force last year because of drug use and that he was in court earlier today uh, for that drug charge. New Orleans has got to be one of the coolest cities in the world. It's just not like other places. The word unique is overused, but New Orleans really is. So people love to go to New Orleans. Hard to go there now, particularly the French Quarter, because it's just too dangerous. And that's a factual statement. New Orleans now has the highest per capita murder rate of any city in the United States. So obviously local media noticed that. Here's one report from a local news channel. 220 homicides so far this year. That's more homicides in the first nine months of 2022 than all of last year. As New Orleans makes national headlines for becoming the murder capital of the country, Raphael Goenechi with the Metropolitan Crime Commission points to the amount of non-fatal shooting victims so far this year, 454. So this is an emergency. There's no bigger. It's even worse than global warming or COVID. People are dying at a greater rate than any place in the United States. So if you were in charge of New Orleans, you would respond immediately. You come up with some plan to stop the murders. But here's how the actual mayor of New Orleans, Latoya Cantrell, responded. News headlines spread around the world about New Orleans being the murder capital of the U.S. I do not embrace that at all. Uh, I don't embrace it because, one, that is the, the, the data even used for that is more of a governmental uh, term for that. It's not based on what's actually happening. In spite of national and world headlines showing New Orleans' murder rate is 17 times higher than New York City's, the mayor downplayed the severity of the problem. Mostly all of them are aligned by people who know one another, not random at all. Oh, they knew one another, so it doesn't matter if they're dead. But the best part is when she said, can, can someone be that dumb and be a mayor of a city? Apparently. She said she just doesn't embrace the data. She doesn't believe them. Apparently, they're just crisis actors pretending to be dead. The Apostle Paul, in his epistle to Timothy, tells us in the last days, society will be in a total immoral meltdown. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. Romans 1.28-32 through 32. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. Being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, they are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. There can be no doubt we are living in the end times right before Jesus Christ returns as we link 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5 with Romans 1, 28 through 32. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A, admit that you're a sinner. B, Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. When a person comes to know Jesus as their Savior, they are brought into a relationship with God that guarantees their salvation as eternally secure. To be clear, salvation is more than saying a prayer or making a decision for Christ. Salvation is a sovereign act of God, whereby an unregenerate sinner is washed, renewed, 
and born again by the Holy Spirit, as we read in John 3.3 and Titus 3.5. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. When salvation occurs, God gives the forgiven sinner a new heart and puts a new spirit within him, as we read in Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. The spirit will cause the saved person to walk in obedience to God's word, as we read in Ezekiel 36, 27 and James 2, 26. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So what about repentance? Repentance is not a work we do to earn salvation. No one can repent and come to God unless God draws that person to himself. As we read in John 6:44, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Repentance is something God gives. It is only possible because of his grace. All of salvation, including repentance and faith, is a result of God drawing us, opening our eyes, and changing our hearts. God's long-suffering leads us to repentance, and so does his kindness, as we read in 2 Peter 3.9 and Romans 2.4. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 declares, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Works are not the cause of salvation. Works are the evidence of salvation. Faith in Christ always results in good works. The person who claims to be a Christian but lives in willful disobedience to Christ, has a false or dead faith and is not saved. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. That is why John the Baptist called people to produce fruit in keeping with repentance, as we read in Matthew 3.8. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. A person who has truly repented of his sin and exercised faith in Christ will give evidence of a changed life, as we read in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. A person who has not repented of their sin and exercised faith in Christ will give evidence of the works of the flesh, as we read in Galatians 5:19 through 21. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. A person who has crucified the flesh and belongs to Christ will give evidence of the Spirit, as we read in Galatians 5.22-24. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Believers are born again, regenerated when they believe. For a Christian to lose his salvation, he would have to be unregenerated. The Bible gives no evidence that the new birth can be taken away. The Holy Spirit indwells all believers, as we read in John 14, 17. The Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees Him or knows Him, but you know Him, for He dwells with you and will be in you. The Holy Spirit baptizes all believers into the body of Christ, as we read in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For a believer to become unsaved, he would have to be unindwelt and detached from the body of Christ. John 3.15 states, 
that whoever believes in Jesus Christ will have eternal life. If you believe in Christ today and have eternal life, but lose it tomorrow, then it was never eternal at all. Hence, if you lose your salvation, the promises of eternal life in the Bible would be in error. Scripture says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Remember, the same God who saved you is the same God who will keep you. Once we are saved, we are always saved. Praise God, our salvation is most definitely, eternally secure. Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready.